Good morning. I want to begin this morning with a story from my life. When I turned 18, although I had accepted Christ when I was younger, I felt a strong desire to grow in my faith. As I began young adulthood, I knew that I wanted to become more intentional with the kind of person that I was becoming, and I felt a growing desire to become more like Christ. As I read the Bible and began to attend a small group from our church, I felt an eagerness to learn more about my faith and to grow in the qualities that the Bible described for Christ followers, things like love and joy and peace. I wanted to truly experience those things. So as a young Christian, I found myself looking up to other Christians to learn what it meant to be a Christ follower. I looked up to Christians that I knew personally, as well as Christian teachers and authors that I admired and respected, and I studied their behavior. And as I watched them, I asked myself, how do Christians act? How do Christians speak? How do Christians dress? As I learned from others that I respected, I began to simply copy their behavior in an effort to look more like a Christ follower on the outside. I thought that the fastest way to become a mature Christian was just to begin acting and speaking like other Christians. For example, one Christian author that I really admired was part of this radical group of Christ followers who sold everything they had and gave all their money to the poor in an effort to love their neighbors. And since I wanted to be someone who loved his neighbors or at least look like someone who loved his neighbors, I tried to sell a few of my possessions so that I could be more like them. Now, as a disclaimer, it is good to learn from older Christians, especially mentors that we trust. But here was the problem. Although I had been taught that that true transformation comes from the inside out, I subconsciously believed it was simply easier to just change my behavior. What did it matter if I was truly growing in love for my neighbor as long as everyone around me thought of me as more loving? Wasn't that the same thing? Did I really need to become more patient on the inside? Or or was it enough that the people around me thought of me as patient, even if I was struggling with selfishness? I wanted the people around me to think of me as a Christ-like person, so I simply imitated the words and actions of other Christians. Although my desire to grow in my faith was sincere, the problem was that I was thinking more about the outside, more about the surface of my life than my heart. I was focusing more on changing the outside of my life than growing on the inside of my life. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus addresses this issue. He makes it clear that true transformation comes from the inside out. In Matthew chapter 23, he is speaking to a group of people and he gives a few warnings against hypocrisy, especially towards the Pharisees and the religious leaders at the time. In verses 25 to 26, he says this, "'Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites!' You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. This passage is a pretty good description of what I was struggling with during the season of my life as a young Christian. I was more concerned with simply cleaning the outside of the cup and dish, instead of of growing in my personal relationship with God and inviting the Holy Spirit to transform me, to clean me from the inside out. During the season of life, I had a clear idea in my head about the kind of Christ follower that I wanted to be and the kind of Christian life that I wanted to live. But instead of trusting God to change my heart, I just tried to change the outside of my life. Now, my relationship with God was certainly growing during this time, but I wanted to speed up sanctification on my own strength. And to be honest, this is still something that I struggle with at times in my life, and I don't think I'm alone. 
At different times in our life, I think it's fair to say that a lot of us wrestle with simply just changing our behavior to look more like what we think a Christ follower should look like instead of cleaning the inside of the cup and dish. We sometimes rely on our own strength to become more like Christ. This morning, we are continuing our series on the book of Galatians. And as part of this series, we are beginning a new mini-series for the summer on the fruit of the Spirit. Now, as a brief reminder, over the last few weeks, we have learned about how we are saved by grace through faith, not by our own works. Throughout this book, Paul makes it clear over and over again that we cannot do anything to save ourselves, but rather we are saved only through Christ's sacrifice for us. And then, in the later chapters of this book, especially chapter 5, where we are right now, Paul addresses the importance of using the freedom that we have found in Christ as an invitation to grow in Christ-likeness rather than as a license to sin. Last week, Pastor Steve shared a message about walking by the Spirit rather than gratifying the desires of the flesh. In Galatians 5, 16 to 21, Paul contrasts the difference between living life by the flesh and living life by the Spirit. He even gives us a list of a few examples of the things that happen when we use our freedom simply to live however we want, instead of living the way that God calls us to live. In this chapter, chapter 5, Paul is reminding us that we are called to use our freedom in Christ to grow in sanctification, to become more like Christ. In Galatians 5, verse 13, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So, In contrast to the acts of the flesh that that Paul listed in verses 19 to 21, in verse 22, he begins to describe the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in Christ followers as they use their freedom to grow deeper in their relationship with God. In Galatians 5, 22 to 23, we read this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Throughout the summer, we will be walking through this passage together as we focus on a different part of this list each week. And I am excited for us to learn more about each attribute that Paul describes in this passage and ultimately for all of us to grow together, to continue growing in the fruit of the Spirit as we follow Christ. This morning, I will begin by introducing us to this list as a whole by asking two important questions, as well as discussing the first characteristic on this list, which is love. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for your word. Thank you for how it encourages us, teaches us, corrects us. And this morning, Father, as we turn our attention to this passage in Galatians, where we learn about the fruit of the Spirit, I pray, first of all, that we would learn more about the fruit of the Spirit, but also, Lord, that you would continue to work in us to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. May we all come away from this morning with a deeper sense of the kind of people that, through your Spirit, you are making us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, as we begin our mini-series on the fruit of the Spirit, we will begin by asking two important questions about this passage. First, what is the fruit of the Spirit? And second, how do we grow in it? This is likely a list that you are familiar with, especially if you have grown up in the church. But it is important that we understand the answers to these questions before we begin discussing each attribute on the list throughout the summer. Because this list describes the kind of person that we want to become. I think it's fair to say that we all want to be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful as we follow Christ. And so it is important for us to understand how we can grow in these areas to the glory of God. 
So first, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, this passage, Galatians 5, to 23, uh, summarizes nine qualities that the Holy Spirit produces in the life of a Christian. In this passage, Paul describes the characteristics that, that should mark the lives of those who are being transformed by the Spirit. It is a list of what we should expect to find in the life of a faithful Christ follower. As Christians who are using their freedom not for themselves and to live however they want, but to grow in their faith, then scripture says we will increasingly become people who love others well. People who experience and share joy. People who are peaceful and who bring peace with them where they go. People who are patient even during hard seasons. People who continually are kind to others. People who celebrate goodness rather than evil. People who are faithful in all areas of their lives. People who are gentle towards others. And people who exercise self-control. Now, it is important for us to understand that this passage is not a list of nine different fruits that are disconnected from each other. It's not as if this list is summarizing nine different qualities that are completely independent from each other. Rather, this passage is describing one fruit that has nine different parts to it, and all of these parts are connected to each other. Paul uses the single word fruit to describe this list of what we will see in the life of a spirit-filled person. And when we read this list, we may be inclined to think of them as separate from each other. We may be inclined to imagine a basket that has nine different apples in it. However, a better image of the fruit of the Spirit, and one that you're going to see throughout the summer, is of a pomegranate, or of an orange maybe. It's one fruit that has different parts to it that make up the whole. And as we grow in the fruit of the Spirit, it's important to realize that we will see growth in all of these areas and they work together in our lives to make us more like Christ. To continue the story from before, when I was younger and I was still learning what it meant to grow in my faith, I remember once that I made a plan to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, to develop in the fruit of the Spirit uh, by focusing on each fruit in the list for one month at a time. Uh, <laughs> so during the month of January, I was going to become more loving. From January 1st to January 31st, I was going to learn what it meant to become more loving. I was going to read books about it, read scripture, maybe listen to music about love, and by the end of the month, I was going to be more loving. And then that was done. I was a loving person. Okay, February, now it's time to increase my joy. I'm going to become a more joyful person in the month of February. And once February is done, March, it's time for peace. I'm going to become a more peaceful person this month. You see, in my mind, I thought that I could work on each of these qualities in isolation from each other, and I thought that I could just develop them on my own strength. If I could just work hard enough to become more loving in January and joyful in February, then it would just happen. However, as I've grown in my personal relationship with God, I have learned that each characteristic on this list is deeply connected to the others. To, be, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit means to grow in each of these areas in our lives. And so that brings us to the second question. How do we grow in the fruit of the Spirit? Now, we have already mentioned this a few times this morning, but it is a simple truth that bears repeating. As the name suggests, the fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that grows these qualities, that produces these qualities in the life of a Christian. It is the Holy Spirit that transforms us from the inside out to, to make us more like the people that our spirit-renewed hearts want us to be, ultimately to become more like Christ. And this morning, as we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit, if you have questions about what that means, we won't get too far into it this morning, but I would encourage you to go back to last Sunday's message where Steve gave us a brief introduction to the Holy Spirit. So, in contrast 
to the way that I thought Christian growth happened when I was younger, on my own strength, based on my own actions, changing my behavior. It turns out that the way that we grow in the fruit of the Spirit is not simply by trying harder, by clenching our fists and gritting our teeth and trying to force ourselves to become more loving and more joyful and more peaceful. And if you're like me, then you've learned the hard way that you can't grow in these areas on your own. I've tried to become more loving on my own, but my selfishness always seems to get in the way. I've tried to become more joyful on my own, but all I can seem to generate is temporary, circumstantial happiness. I've tried to become more peaceful on my own, but it turns out that I always seem to default back to my fear and anxiety. I've lived long enough to know that if I am depending on myself and my own strength, then I can't grow in these areas. I cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit on my own. So even though I used to think that the way to grow as a Christ follower was simply to change my behavior on my own strength, to clean the outside of the cup and dish, this passage teaches us that it is the Holy Spirit who must transform our hearts. To borrow Jesus' expression in Matthew 23, Christian growth doesn't begin by cleaning the outside of the cup and dish, but it begins with inviting the Holy Spirit to clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Although it is the Holy Spirit that produces the fruit of the Spirit in the life of a Christian, this is not a passive process for us. We do have an active role in this process, but it doesn't begin with behavior modification. As Christ followers, we are called to walk by the Spirit, as Paul says in verse 16, and to keep in step with the Spirit, as he says in verse 25. And by using the language of walking, Paul is comparing the growth of a personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit to taking a long walk with somebody over the course of our lives. As Christ followers, we've learned that we are saved by grace through faith, and this is called justification. But then we begin the process of sanctification, where we invite God to transform us from the inside out so that we can grow in the fruit of the Spirit. To use Pastor Steve's analogy from last Sunday, when we accept Christ, then we receive the pilot light of the Holy Spirit. But then it is up to us to turn up the gas, to invite God to guide us and to work in us each day in our lives. So our work doesn't happen in just simply changing our behavior, but in continually walking with God and walking with the Spirit every day of our lives so that we are empowered to become more like the people described in this list of the fruit of the Spirit, to become more like Christ. As Christians, when we walk step by step with the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives, then we will find this fruit growing in us and transforming us more and more into the people that Paul describes in this passage. And this is an exciting truth. If you're like me, then when you read this list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, then you find yourself thinking, that's who I want to be. That's the kind of life I want to live. One day when I die, that's how I want people to describe me. All of us desire to become more loving, more joyful, and more peaceful, and so on. But maybe we've been just trying to grow in these areas on our own strength, on our own power. The beautiful truth of the Christian life is that for those who are in Christ Jesus, we will grow in the fruit of the Spirit as we walk by the Spirit, as we invite God to work in us and to transform us into Christ likeness. So what does this mean for us? This means that we are invited to walk by the Spirit each day of our lives, to have a personal, active, and intimate relationship with God. For us to keep in step with the Spirit means to live every day in relationship with God and to be growing daily in this relationship. Because if you imagine going for a walk 
with someone, then you need to stay close to them. You need to stay beside them to actually be walking with them. If you were to slow down and let them walk ahead of you, you're not walking together anymore. You're not step by step walking together. If you were to speed up and leave them behind, you're not walking together. To walk with God means to be in continual relationship with him and to be close to him. In practical terms, this happens primarily through the spiritual disciplines, uh, such as Bible reading and prayer and worship. Through these disciplines, we are invited to come to God each day and to ask him to continually renew our minds and hearts as we grow in the fruit of the Spirit. And so, this week, as we begin our mini-series on the fruit of the Spirit, These are important truths for us to remember all throughout the summer. This does not happen on our own strength. This happens through the Spirit. And we'll be reminded of this often because if you're like me, your tendency is to want to go out after you hear a message like this and just be more loving. Just change your behavior to look like a more loving person. But we need to be reminded often that it begins on the inside. To love others well, we must ask God to give us that kind of love. And that brings us to the first attribute on this list, which is love. Love is the first characteristic that Paul teaches us is produced in the life of a Christian who is being transformed from the inside out by the Holy Spirit, in the life of a Christian who is growing deeper in their personal relationship with God. Now, love can be a difficult word to define since there are so many different definitions of this word in our culture, depending on who you ask. For many, love is primarily defined by a feeling. It's how we describe the feelings of affection that we have for our family members and for our loved ones. It can mean different things depending on the context. The the love that you have for your friends is different than the love that you have for your children. People say they love their spouse and they say that they love pizza. There are countless movies and TV shows and songs and plays and novels about the subject, and each one seems to define the word a bit differently. So what is this love that Paul is describing in his list of the fruit of the Spirit? The word that is used in Galatians 5 is translated from the Greek word agape, which describes the highest form of love that comes from God. And in 1 John chapter 3, John answers the question, what is love, directly. It says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. In scripture, the highest form of love is defined by Christ's death on the cross, by Jesus laying down his life for us in the ultimate act of grace. Later, in 1 John chapter 4, John continues his definition of love. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. In these verses, John is teaching that the love that is produced by the Holy Spirit in the life of someone who is walking by the Spirit is characterized by Christ-like selflessness and humility. The love that comes from God is a sacrificial love that puts other people before ourselves. It is a decision to selflessly commit to other people's welfare and to actively find ways to meet our neighbor's needs, even at our own sacrifice or expense. 
This love means that we lay down our lives for the good of the people around us. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that this kind of love is not simply for the people who are kind to us or who love us back, but we are called to love our enemies as well. In 1 Corinthians 13, and it's about to feel like a wedding in here, Paul describes agape love in this way. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And if you were to look back on that list, you might notice how many words that are in those verses that describe the fruit of the Spirit. Love is patient. Forbearance or or patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Love is kind. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And so these fruits work together to make us more like Christ. And simply put, love, the first attribute on this list, is the foundation for everything else we are to become in our lives as we become more like Christ. This is the foundation for who we are growing into as Christ followers. And Paul affirms this point. Uh, Just before the passage that we read in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul teaches about the primary importance of love in the life of a Christian. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, at this point, you might be thinking to yourself that this kind of love doesn't sound possible. This kind of selfless, sacrificial love may feel impossible for us. How can we possibly fulfill the command to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in a sense, you're right. This kind of love is not possible on our own strength. Therefore, our main application for today is, is, as we consider the fruit of the Spirit, is not simply to go out and try our hardest to become more loving. And as I've said, if you're like me, that's going to be your default reaction. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be more loving but rather we need to recognize that the kind of love that is being described in this passage does not come from us. Rather, it is the Holy Spirit that produces it in us as we grow in our personal relationship with God. This point is affirmed in 1 John 4, where John writes, we love because God first loved us. This love comes from God. And it is only through this love that we are able to love him and to love our neighbors as ourselves, as Jesus commands in the Gospels. Therefore, the main work of growing in love as a fruit of the Spirit is not primarily in changing our behavior, of of just changing the way we act or talk. We do certainly have to make decisions in our lives, but it's important that we prioritize our personal relationship with God by walking by the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit each day of our lives. As Christ followers, Scripture makes it clear that we are called to actively love and serve our neighbors every day. We are called to find meaningful, practical ways to show God's love to other people. And this love that is first produced in us by the Holy Spirit is then put into action in our lives. And we work through this love to meet the needs of the people around us. The practical expression of this love will be different for each of us as we live our everyday lives at work and at school and in our families, but the root of this love, the source of this love, is the same for all of us. May we all continue to invite the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out and to help us grow in love for God and for our neighbor, first in our hearts, 
but then in our words and actions in our everyday lives as well. This morning, we're going to close with Christ's words from the Gospel of John. In John 15, Jesus teaches that he is the vine, we are the branches, and the only way that we can bear fruit is by remaining in him. This passage is a reminder that the only way to become a fruitful Christian is to faithfully grow in our personal relationship with him. In John 15, it says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the true vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, my father will give you. This is, is my command. Love each other. Church, may we be people who remain in Christ, or as Paul says it, people who walk in step with the Spirit to grow in a personal relationship with God each day. And as we do so, Scripture teaches that the the Holy Spirit will produce the fruit of the Spirit in us, including this first characteristic of love. May we all become more loving in our everyday lives as we continue to grow in him. And may this all be to his glory. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you first, Lord, for the reminder that the fruit of the Spirit does not come from us. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Thank you that this doesn't have to come from our own strength that we don't have to somehow muster up our own energy, our own work to become more like you, but rather you will work in us. Help us each to consider what it means to continue walking in step with the Spirit in our lives, to continue remaining in you, Jesus, so that you will continue to work in us and make us more like your Son. And we thank you for this, this first attribute on the list of the fruit of the Spirit, love the primary importance of love for a Christ follower. I pray that all of us would continue to grow in love, this love that can only come from you and then expresses itself in all kinds of ways to our neighbors and the people around us. Thank you for your word and thank you for being faithful. In your name we pray, amen.